Good morning. You all may be seated, and children, you can go ahead and head off to your rooms this morning. My name is Jeremy Fritz, and as you may have noticed, our fearless and faithful leader, Pastor Bill, has been on a much-deserved rest from the pulpit. A couple weeks ago, our youth director, Brody, gave a powerful message on freedom, and last week, our pastoral resident had a beautiful sermon on praise. Next week, Lord willing, Bill will be back up here as we continue our summer through the Psalms. Before we get started, I just want to tell you all, my church family, how much I love and appreciate you. If you have known me for any amount of time, you know this to be true, and if we don't know each other yet, I look forward to meeting you. You are all very important to me, and I thank you for loving me and my family the way you do. It is a unique and a special thing to find a community of people that live out their convictions to love the Lord and each other in this way. So, well done, church. Well done. As you walked in this morning, I hope you felt that nice, cool summer breeze we get here in Phoenix. (laughs) I have been a landscaper for almost 30 years, and July is when that punch in the gut turns into a knee to the face. The hot, dry June turns into a hot, muggy July with storms that tend to knock over trees and blow debris everywhere. Over the years, I've become a bit insensitive to people complaining about how hot it is as I watch them walk those 20 steps from their office to their car to their homes, all which have stellar air conditioning. But that is my critical heartsome issue, and I'm working on it with the Lord's help, of course. As I said earlier, I love you all, and I really don't want any of you to be uncomfortable, even if it is for just a few seconds. You know, we commiserate about the heat this time of year, but you can drive less than six hours in almost any direction and have your toes in the sand overlooking the ocean, or be up in the mountains and hear the wind through the pine trees. Even in the desert, you see the beauty and wonder in God's creation. Next time you walk outside, put down your phones and just look and listen. The mountains, the trees, the birds, the wind, the clouds, they all speak to the glory of God. This morning, we are going through all of Psalm 19. This psalm lays out God's glory through creation, which is a general revelation to all mankind, and God's glory through the written word, which is a specific or a special revelation to all those who hear and believe. Psalm 19 is one of at least 73 of the psalms written by King David, and C.S. Lewis refers to it as the greatest poem in the Psalter and one of the greatest lyrics in the world. I just recently learned what the Psalter was. That's a great quote. This particular psalm is broken up into three distinct parts that fit together perfectly, and the truths we see in this passage are undeniable. If you don't have a Bible, you can follow along in one of the black Bibles on page 426. Join me in prayer, please. Lord, we come before you this morning in awe of your beauty and your wonder. Thank you for your creation. Thank you for your written word, and thank you for redemption through your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, please forgive us for the times that we fail to recognize or fail to admit that we are weak and foolish and broken, or for the times where we may even try to set ourselves upon your throne. Lord, I ask this morning that your spirit would be present in this place, and that you would guide my thoughts and my words for your glory. It is in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Psalm 19. I'm just learning to how to use glasses, so bear with me. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. 
more to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Back in the great plague of 2020, there was this wee little man who was extremely accomplished in his field. He liked to get up in his platform and say, trust the science. (laughs) Remember what I'm talking about? Well, I couldn't agree with that statement more. Here's how the internet defines science. The systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation, experimentation, and the testing of theories against the evidence obtained. Science, in its pure and unweaponized form, is just us humans trying to unravel and possibly manipulate the mysteries of Almighty God. In these six verses, David points out that God has given us all a general revelation through the physical and natural world. And what does this creation have to mean? Well, that there's a creator. Whether you believe that God in his infinite power and might created everything in the literal six days, or you believe that in his creativity and beauty he let things roll out over millennium, the fact of the matter remains is that you and I are here on this earth today because of a creator. Verse 1 of Psalm 19 says that the heavens declare and the sky proclaims. There's a reason why people sit back and look at the stars in awe, even if they don't really know what they're in awe about. Earlier this year, we had an aurora in Phoenix that was apparently best viewed up by Lake Pleasant. We'd been out fishing that night, and as we were coming off the lake, there were thousands of people coming out and lining the sides of the road. I imagine most of them were there intentionally to see the glory of God on display, but that is in fact what they were doing. Deuteronomy 4.19 says, And beware, lest you raise your eyes to heaven, and you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the host of heaven. You be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them, things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. It can be easy to get caught up in the... Oh, our screen's out, you guys, so if you can't see this, I'm sorry. It can be easy to get caught up in the beauty and wonder of creation, but it is a creator and not his creation that deserve our worship. Psalm 14 starts out by saying, A fool says in his heart, there is no God. Let's say you get the opportunity to climb to the top of a remote mountain or maybe even jump a SpaceX flight to the moon at some point in the future. And when you get there, you find a painting on a rock. Your reaction would be, somebody must have made that, right? The average adult male alone has 36 trillion cells in his body, all working together in beautiful chaos. There are over 500 species of sharks swimming in our ocean, and only about a dozen of them want to eat you. This earth has 2,500 types of palm trees, 3,000 species of snakes, and about 10,000 species of birds, all which range from dull brown to bright as a rainbow. According to Scripture, you have to be a complete and utter fool to step back and say, yeah, I see all that could have just happened. Our reaction has to be, somebody must have made all this, right? And why so many different varieties and species? I believe it's to show the undeniable glory of God. He probably didn't have to create over a million species of insects to sustain this earth, but he did it anyway. Also, that we could sit back and proclaim that we have an awesome God. Verses 2 through the first part of 4 describe how the natural cycle of day and night speak of the one who created them, and that nothing is hidden from this knowledge. Before compasses were invented, ships would navigate by sun during the day and by stars at night. These things were so constant and predictable that people could count on them for how they lived life. We still plant and harvest according to the seasons, and though we may try and try and try, we can't slow the hands of time or add another minute to our lives. I can't say for certain, but I don't imagine that the cavemen were sitting back wondering if a monkey somehow came from a swamp amoeba. They more likely, more likely sat in awe and wonder of the glory of creation. Creation screams for a creator. I think as Christians, we sometimes feel that burden to convince people that God exists, but that isn't our role. Our puny little words can't even begin to compare to what the Lord has laid out through creation. The end of verse 4 through verse 6 talks about how the sun bursts out in the morning like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, 
or a strong man running his course with joy. <laughs> when I first read this, I thought about how I get no joy in running. And if we're going to trust the science this morning, I'm pretty sure they have proven that running is bad for you by now. But thinking more about it, I pictured a marathon runner coming across that finish line or through the ribbon with hands high and a huge smile on his face. If you have ever trained properly for a race, there is excitement and your speed is consistent throughout until you've completed your course with joy. When I finally convinced Emily to marry me, I was so dang proud and excited to become her husband that nothing short of death was going to keep me from that altar. And these illustrations of a runner and a bridegroom don't really do the sun justice. People used to believe that the sun revolved around the earth, and it wasn't universally accepted until the 1500s that the earth indeed revolves around the sun. And now scientists believe that even the sun rotates around the center of our Milky Way galaxy once every 230 million years. You know what's great about making a prediction like that? You will not be here if it doesn't come to be. <laughs> As humans, we've accomplished some pretty remarkable things. But even if we were able to go total scorched earth, the sun would still rise and set that next day. Only God can take the earth off its axis or make the stars fall from the sky. Creation is God's general revelation to all mankind, and it is undeniable. Romans 1, 19 and 20 says, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. As far as not seeing a creator through creation, we are without excuse. Next, we see the shift from God's general revelation to God's specific or special revelation through the written word. Verses 7 through 11. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. In these five verses, we see six nouns that help paint a bigger picture of God's word. Six adjectives that make this truth all the sweeter, and six benefits in applying these words. David uses six different illustrations here to pretty much say the same thing, or at least nail down the same point. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 reminds us that all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be, be complete, equipped for every good work. Now, this section of Psalms was written long before those words of Paul and is, and is specifically referring to the Torah, which is the law of God as revealed to Moses in the first five books of the Bible. But God, in his infinite wisdom and grace towards us, has given us this whole book for our instruction. Verse 7 says that the law of the Lord is perfect. Nothing else in creation is perfect. Even our newborn babies, although extremely precious, are nothing close to perfect. I remember when our twin girls were born, I would just sit and stare at them in awe, totally unaffected by the constant messes we would have to clean up. Now, we've got three great children, but if you are a parent of older, of older kids, you know they don't become any closer to perfection as they roll into the teenage years. In contrast, the written word of the Lord is perfect and sure. It revives the soul and makes wise and simple. The longer I'm on this earth, the more I understand what this means. There are so many resources out there these days for knowledge and overcoming adversity, but a lot of them seem to shift or change or modify with the times. Not God's word, though. It remains a constant and proven source of instruction and wisdom. I have been called simple-minded for only using Scripture as my ultimate authority. But the fact remains, it has never let me down. Never. Even those hard truths are for our good and for His glory. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. This guide for life, even void of truly understanding it, is flat out a good way to live. It spells out how to have a fruitful life and helps us to clearly see how to engage troubles and conflicts that might, that might arise. 
if you don't spend any time in God's word, you're going to have difficulty navigating this life as a Christian. He has given us his written word to showcase his glory, but we need to know what it says before we can even begin to understand or apply it. Verse 9 talks about how the fear of the Lord is clean and the rules of the Lord are true. That word fear doesn't mean that you should be afraid, but rather have an awe and a reverence that puts you on your face in submission. The same God that put all of creation into motion loved us enough to give us direction through his word. Sometimes we can bristle at that word rules, but for the most part, rules are for protection and order. And in the case of God's rules, they are clean and true and perfect. So many things around us are temporal and fading. But we're reminded in verse 8 of Isaiah 40 that the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Verse 10. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. Back in the days before Bitcoin and high fructose corn syrup, gold held a high value, and honey was a staple for sweeteners. I love how David uses this imagery here in verse 10. Are you more concerned with your next deal or your next meal than you are in what the Lord has for you through Scripture? We have been given something of high value that is sweet to the soul. It's full of wisdom, insights, warnings, rewards, freedom, and ultimately is a story of God's glory. Please don't take for granted this gift we have at our fingertips. In the final three verses, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, David moves, moves from God's glory through his word to God's glory through redemption. Verses 12 through 14. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I think some people believe God cruel to have created us and then allowed sin and suffering. But it was our willful disobedience that brought about sin which ultimately led to the broken world. God didn't have to create us. If you read through Revelation, there are already loads of magnificent beings that proclaim God's greatness constantly. God chose to create us so that we could see and experience his glory for our benefit. David recognizes his weakness and depravity in light of God's holiness, and he pens this beautiful prayer at the end of Psalm 19. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. This Christian life can be a funny thing. Just when we start to see some victory over areas of sin in our life, we get convicted about things we didn't even realize we were falling short on. Paul's journey through Scripture comes to mind when I read this. After encountering the risen Christ, Paul starts off by calling himself the least of the apostles. This is a posture of humility for sure, but he puts, still puts himself in a quite prestigious category. By the end of his life, he tells Timothy that he is the chief of all sinners. There is not a recorded man that walked this earth, apart from when Jesus came in the flesh, that did more for God's kingdom than Paul. And he calls himself the El Hefe sinner. If this is the great evangelist Paul, what does that make me or, or you? In 2 Corinthians 12, Paul asked the Lord three times to remove a thorn in his flesh. Now, we don't know exactly what that thorn was, but it was something that highlighted Paul's weakness. When God says no, he explains that his grace is sufficient and that his power is made perfect in weakness. <laughs> God's glory is even revealed through our shortcomings in our pain, in our sin. If you're sitting here today thinking that you've made it, that you are a good person, you may want to ask the Lord to reveal your hidden faults. I really do say this because I love you. And God's glory is revealed most in the life of a repentant sinner. Verse 13. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. 
then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. <laughs> a presumptuous sin is a willful sin. And man, they're the worst. Anger, pride, lust, indulgence. Whatever it is you know is sin, but choose to do it anyway. Maybe you think you've earned it because you've been oh so good lately. Or maybe you just let the flesh make the decision instead of walking in the spirit. We are all guilty of this at times, but to sin intentionally is to disregard and mock the glory of God. When we overcome these willful sins through the power of the Holy Spirit and self-control, we become innocent of great transgression. Prayer and accountability are the best tools for this. Constantly plead that the Lord would deliver you from these sins and confess to each other so you have eyes on you. Do not put yourself on an imaginary island where you are free to sin without consequence. Let your obedient lives display the glory of God to those around you. Then we come to the sort of the climax of this prayer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So many times something has come out of my mouth and I thought, dang, that didn't please the Lord at all. James tells us that the tongue stains the whole body and what is in our heart comes out of our mouths. And then this passage takes it even a step further. The words we say can wound those around us for sure, but our wicked thoughts are a direct affront to God and his glory. Who can even begin to have a glimmer of hope in this? The sobering truth is that none of us can within ourselves. But we are reminded in 1 Corinthians 15, 57, But thanks be to God, who gives us victory through Christ Jesus. This Christ Jesus is our good news and where we find that hope. Colossians 3, 5, and 6 says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and all covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. The wrath of God is indeed coming. I know that doesn't elicit the warm and fuzzies, but we can't take the good part of God's truth without accepting the warnings. Whether it is tomorrow or thousands of years from now, God will call this world to account for its sin, wickedness, and blatant disregard for his glory. We are all guilty of breaking the law of God in one way or another, if not the whole thing. That is what is referred to as sin or missing the mark. God's word is just as clear about the road to redemption as it is about his unwillingness to tolerate sin for eternity. The first four books of the New Testament which are considered the Gospels, they clearly tell the story of how Almighty God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to be born a man, to live a perfect life, to share the will of His Father with the inhabitants of earth, also that He could be sacrificed as a substitution for us. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Our responsibility is to receive that free gift, turn from our sins, and confess Jesus as Lord. Now, after Jesus was killed on our behalf, he was raised to life and set back in his rightful place. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus, he promises to send you the helper or the Holy Spirit who will radically change your heart and let you experience victory over sin. John 14, 26 says, But the helper... The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. This poem of David starts off describing God as creator and ends with the fact that he is our redeemer. If you don't know much about David's life, I would encourage you to look into First and Second Samuel to see the roller coaster ride that he went on. David did some really great things, and then he did some really terrible things. But at the end of it all, he was still called a man after God's own heart. David, in his failures and weakness, always acknowledged God as the ultimate king. And he repented when he was called to account for his sin. And God, although he allowed some pretty grievous consequences in David's life, was always gracious and merciful with him until his death. I don't know where you all sit in your walk with the Lord, but I hope you can take courage in the example of David's life. 
you are not too broken or too insignificant for the Lord to use in a powerful way, in a small context or maybe even in a massive context. There is so much victory and freedom in being a a redeemed servant of the king. I wasn't a very good young person. In fact, I was pretty terrible. I won't bore you with the details, and I'm not going to give any more space in my life to that sin, but I spent lots of years in shame wishing I could go back and unhurt so many people. I had no good excuse for being this way either. I had strong Christian parents and grandparents and a decent church community as I was growing up. My grandpa was a founding elder of a little church up the road called Scottsdale Bible Church, I believe I have a picture of him breaking ground on the Shea campus. Must have been at least a couple years ago. (laughs) During my teenage years, he and my grandma were missionaries in Africa and Papua New Guinea, and by the time they got back stateside, most of my family had written me off as a lost cause, and rightfully so. But grandpa was always so kind to me, and he tolerated my outbursts in a way that made them seem so foolish to me. He was a great example of the love of Christ, and I believe the Lord used him in a big way as he was coming after my heart. Fast forward several years through meeting my wife, getting plugged back into the church, and eagerly pursuing the Lord. I got the opportunity to sit with Grandpa right before he died, and I thanked him for not giving up on me. He simply said that God can redeem anybody, and I believe that sooner or later, Jeremy, he was going to get you as well. That funeral had a packed house. And Roy Fritz's life displayed the glory of God in a big way. Just like any of you in this room, on the right side of redemption, can glorify God in a big way with your lives. I would like to ask the worship team to join me as we close things out. Living in the same area I grew up in, we often run into people that I knew from school. More than a couple of times, I've been asked something along the lines of what's different about you. Apart from the fact that I got old, I get to share the I get to share the good news of my testimony that nobody can argue with. That I'm a completely different person, and that is only because Jesus Christ changed my heart. Second Corinthians 5:17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. Maybe you have a story similar to mine, or maybe you just always believed and followed the Lord. Either way, you are a walking miracle, and the world will benefit from your testimony. That is God's glory and redemption. Behold, the new has come. Maybe you haven't embraced this whole, I'm a sinner and I need Jesus thing yet. That's okay. Here's what I have to say to you. God can redeem anybody, and I believe sooner or later, he will get you as well. So until then, my friends, I will be praying for you. Just like someone once was praying that same thing for me. Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lord, we thank you for creation, for your word, and for redemption through your son, Jesus. Lord, let us never take these things for granted. And let us be found blameless and innocent of great transgression. God, if there's anyone here this morning who does not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, God, I pray that you would call them in a way that is undeniable. It is in your holy and glorious and righteous name we pray all these things. Amen.